Good morning, my name's Marina. I work as a nurse practitioner with the Brain Cancer Group. I'd like to begin by acknowledging all traditional custodians and pay respects to elders past and present. As we endeavour to serve the health needs within the community, we recognise the importance of the land and the waterways as an integral part of people's health and wellbeing. At the Brain Cancer Group, we are focused on improving patient outcomes across the spectrum. We do this by taking a multidisciplinary and collaborative approach aimed at improving the lives of those impacted by brain cancer. We achieve this by fulfilling three tiers, research, education and support. We welcome you to the Meningioma, Meningioma Patient Education Day. We now have two videos from our two supports, Dr. Raymond Cook from the Brain Cancer Group and Catherine Heinsen from Brain Tune Alliance Australia. So thank you very much for attending this uh, virtual meningioma patient education day. We thought we'd choose the topic of meningioma because it's often forgotten about. Most of the uh, tumour meetings are about glioma and meningioma tends to get a bit swept aside, but probably about 20% of meningiomas causes uh, problems uh, from the uh, surgical and the oncological point of view. Uh, so about 20% of the tumours uh, that are meningiomas are atypical meningiomas or even malignant meningiomas and they need some sort of advanced therapy for management. So we're gonna cover the pathology with Jonathan Parkinson's, the surgery with Dr. Jonathan Parkinson. We're gonna do the imaging with Jamie Drummond today. And Michael Back's gonna look at some of the specialized radiotherapy techniques for the management of meningioma. And uh, lastly, uh, Jeff Chembry is going to talk about uh, a novel therapy that can be uh, useful, certainly in the research um, situation where we attach an antibody to a receptor on the meningioma cell and try and influence um, how it behaves for the more difficult cases, uh, the instance where meningiomas are either widespread in the brain or diffuse or very difficult to control with the other two therapies. So again, uh, on behalf of BCG, I want to thank you for uh, attending this meeting. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be part of this first meningioma forum in Australia. I would like to thank the Brain Cancer Group, Care to Cure, for inviting Brain Tumor Alliance Australia to co-sponsor this forum. I'd also like to thank all the doctors who freely give of their time to make this day possible. My name is Catherine Heinsen and I'm the chair of Brain Tumor Alliance Australia, BTAA. We're a national brain tumor support group. We support all Australians affected with brain tumors with our 24 hour 1800 support line a monthly e-news, biannual magazine, annual forums, and we connect people to various support groups around Australia. We're also part of the International Brain Tumour Alliance. I really encourage you to subscribe to our website if you have not already done so, as there is a wealth of information there, and it also connects you to the International Brain Tumour Alliance. I do hope you enjoy this forum and find it most informative. Our first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Parkinson, neurosurgeon, who will give an overview of meningiomas. Well, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Marina. I'd also like to acknowledge Marina's contribution um, to getting this day organized as, long as, uh, as well as uh, Dennis Trataris from Rana Communications, who's helping with the IT, and also everyone from the Brain Cancer Group, who's been um, who's been uh, instrumental in getting this all together. And thank you to BTAA for co-sponsoring, and um, it's a pleasure to be able to be here today. I appreciate the thanks in your video there, Catherine. Um, my name's Jonathan Parkinson. I'm a neurosurgeon at Royal North Shore and at North Shore Private. I'm also a, um, a board member of the Brain Cancer Group. I just wanted to give a brief introduction. You'll hear from me again later about surgery and some of the nuances of surgery. Just a couple of things about um, meningioma to get us started. I'd also like to thank everyone for sending their questions ahead. We've, all of the speakers today have tried to, if there's questions that fall into their area of expertise, um, tried to kind of answer some of those questions. So hopefully you'll find that helpful. There will be a and a portion at the end of, the, uh, end of today. Uh, but if there's any um, any uh, further questions, then you can put them in the Q and A panel or in the in the chat. 
um, like I say, we'll try and get to many of them through our talks. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll go away with the answers you were hopping for. Um, to talk about meningiomas, what are they? Well, meningioma is the commonest primary central um, nervous system tumor. Um, yeah, and they probably exist in about two to 3% of the population if we look at um, autopsy studies. Um, they're more common in females with a ratio of about two to one. Um, and the median age of diagnosis, that is the average age at which people discover that they have a meningioma is 66. Meningiomas can arise anywhere in the central nervous system, so in the brain uh, or in the spine. Um, and basically that relates to, to where these tumors arise from. So that diagram on the left shows us the scalp and then the layers until we get down to the brain. Um, we have the skull and then we have the dura uh, and what's called the arachnoid. And then over in the other, uh, the other the second picture here shows us um, the, again, the layers of the brain, the SAS stands for subarachnoid space, uh, and then the dura in blue. But we do have these arachnoid cap cells, which are the cells that come from the arachnoid into the dura, and that's, they're the cells from which we think meningiomas arise. So, and, but why do they become meningiomas? Well, the vast major majority of meningiomas are what we call sporadic. Uh, that is that they just occur uh, for no particular reason. Something in the kind of programming of those cells just causes them to grow in an abnormal manner. And, that, um, and that's uh, something that, you know, we don't, uh, we, we don't know why they happen in the vast majority of people. There were quite a few questions um, from you all about, about meningiomas and the genetic side and if they run in families. Um, and again, like I say, most of them are what, what we call sporadic. Um, that is that they occur uh, out of nowhere, but there are some, um, some genetic syndromes that are quite rare uh, with which the, these tumors can be associated. So neurofibromatosis type two is, is probably the main one that we see people who have meningiomas as well as other things, including um, vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma and potentially other schwannomas. Um, all, most of these other sy syndromes listed there are very, very rare. Um, in terms of, are there any environmental factors? So, um, you know, uh, radiation is really the only one that we know of. Um, a long time ago, uh, they used to treat tinea capitis with radiation, and that led to a whole bunch of people getting meningiomas. Um, but, uh, and there is some association, although not, not necessarily a causative association between obesity, between occupational exposure to some chemicals and things, and then also hormone levels that may be... Um, may lead to meningioma formation. But none of these are shown to be definite links with these tumors. Uh, the other question obviously everyone asks about is mobile phones. And again, there is no, um, no documented uh, link between mobile, mobile phones and meningiomas. If we talk about the genetics though, like thinking about what a, um, what a tumor is, is basically a tumor develops anywhere in the body when when the genetic material, that is the program that makes that cell, that cell gets deranged in some way. Something goes wrong with it and it causes the cells to grow in a different way and they develop into some sort of tumor. So we get these long lists of various differences within the cells um, that, are, that are part of a tumor. And in this case, we're talking about meningioma where there's a bunch of different types of abnormalities that can develop. Now, none of, none of these are particularly strongly inherited, but there probably is some association between um, the propensity to develop these problems with people who are in families. So I think that, you know, that, that, that we do certainly see, and I know there's people on, on the call today who have multiple family members who have um, meningiomas. They, uh, there probably is some indirect association just more a propensity rather than uh, that is that they're more likely to develop one of these alterations rather than there being a solid kind of link. There's another area of analysis that we're starting to do, to do in the lab called methylation analysis. That's where we look at various genes 
um, within the cells. And I think in the next five years or so, in the next kind of in, um, uh, revision of the, the, the book we use to diagnose tumours, um, we will see a methylation analysis being an important part with meningioma. What's very important from meningioma from a pathology point of view, however, is what's called the grade. Um, and that's basically a, a, an estimation based on how things look down a microscope as to what, how aggressive these tumours are. Obviously, when we talk about treatments, surgery included, but also some of the other treatments you hear about, uh, there, it's always an analysis of risk and expectation um, of growth. So, so if we're going to have someone take the risk of having a treatment like radiation or chemo or other treatments, then there needs to be, um, we need to be fairly certain that, that that's in their best interest because the tumour is going to grow. And that's really where the grade of the tumour comes into it. I'll, I'll talk about this again in my surgery talk, but meningiomas are graded either grade one, two or three based upon the um, based upon some of the cellular features that is what the pathologist sees when they look uh, down the microscope um, uh, that has implications as to what treatment whether it's surgery alone whether it's some combination of surgery and radiation or if there are other treatments that are appropriate but fundamentally the grade's important because it pre predicts how likely it is um, for tumors to progress or for tumors to recur so grade one meningiomas, recurrence is very rare, whereas malignant meningiomas, uh, it's, always, it's almost inevitable. How do people with meningiomas present? And again, this is one of the question, questions. Um, well, there's a, a bunch of general symptoms that people can have. So headache being the main one, um, raised intracranial pressure because of just an increased uh, like a mass in a box of a fixed size being the skull that can give you headache or a whole bunch of other symptoms. Seizures is another very common um, presentation uh, of, um, of meningiomas. Uh, and one, I didn't list it there, but we're seeing more and more people who have an, an incidental finding of a meningioma where they have a scan because they've hit their head or, or a headache that's unrelated to the meningioma um, and a meningioma is detected. There are a whole bunch also of, I guess, location specific type symptoms where we see a meningioma pushing on something and that leads to a particular set of symptoms. And it's a bit of a recurring theme between my talk and, and, and the others that the location of a meningioma is really one of the most important things. And we certainly do see a whole bunch of different locations that these tumors can develop. Um, and depending on where they are, the symptoms are different. And sometimes they can be large before people have symptoms. Sometimes they're small. Uh, but again, we'll come back to that. So how do we detect where meningiomas are? Well, that leads nicely into the next talk, which is from, uh, from uh, Dr. Drummond. So I'll hand back to Marina. Thanks, Jonathan. Dr. James Drummond is a neuroradiologist and he'll discuss imaging techniques. Well, I hope you can hear me. Uh, good morning. And thank you, Marina, for organizing all this and the Brain Cancer Group. And I hope this is helpful both to patients and some of their support um, teams. I'm one of the neuroradiologists at Royal North Shore and North Shore Private Hospital at North Shore Radiology. And I'm the nascent chief of one of our new uh, projects under the Brain Cancer Group, the Brain Imaging Laboratory. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is sort of the basics of imaging in meningiomas. Um, and it, it will build on what Dr. Parkinson just said, and it will feed nicely into what Dr. Shembri will talk about uh, in nuclear medicine. So let me see if I can actually move forward. So there are really some workhorse methods of, of imaging meningiomas, and sometimes patients get a bit lost because we tend to take a lot of pictures in meningiomas, and a lot of these scanners tend to look the same. So you know, you go through CT to MR and often onto PET, uh, particularly within our group. But, you know, people and patients get a bit confused sometimes between why we're taking so many pictures and why we're using so many different methods. The real, you know, initial workhorse in meningioma imaging is CT, and almost all patients have had a CT by the time they come to us. And MRI is not always the best thing for a meningioma. CT actually provides some information that MR doesn't. 
So CT is excellent at looking at the bones. And it's also a very good way for us to look at some of the vessels sometimes. And that's why we often give patients the contrast dye. And MRI is also the real workhorse in meningioma. So when we work meningiomas up to try and work out the extent of them and what they're involving and how we follow meningiomas up, MRI is really what we're going to use to follow patients long term. Now, angiography is a sort of up for a bit of a debate in meningioma about how useful it is. And it went through a, a very popular period. Um, it's quite an invasive method. And we put a little wire in your groin and we go up and we feed a tube up to the meningioma to try and look at the blood vessels supplying the meningioma. And particularly in the US, not so much in Europe, there was a big push to try and block off some of the blood supply to meningiomas before we operate on them. It's a bit debatable about how useful that has been. Um, and we really don't use this very commonly in Australia just because of there's quite a lot of inherent risk with this kind of invasive procedure. And finally is the nuclear medicine side of things. And Dr. Shembri will talk to you about some of those imaging. So really, you know, my interest lies in, in these two modalities, which almost all of our patients are, are very used to. The question I probably get asked the most is, do I have to have contrast? Do I always need to have the needle? And, uh, and I get it, you know, I'm a radiologist and we sort of hide in the background and we often don't have to put the needles in. But I'm just showing you here two examples of just how incredibly useful the contrast is for our imaging. So on the left here, we've got a CT scan and we've, we've sliced the, through the head in, in that direction. On the right here, we've got an MRI scan, so we've sliced through in that direction. And these two scans are without contrast. And if we pass on to the next study, we can see that these two scans are now with contrast. So if you looked at this scan without the contrast, it's almost difficult to see them in ingioma. Whereas here with contrast, everyone can see just how obvious it jumps out. And again, on MRI, you can see how easy it is on their post-contrast imaging to see the meningioma without the contrast. So often I get asked questions by patients, particularly on follow-up, do I need contrast and do I need it every time? And unfortunately, the reality is you do. It makes a huge difference for us as radiologists. You know, in these cases where there are enormous lesions, it doesn't matter. But if you imagine you've got a three millimeter lesion, it makes a huge difference to us. The other question I get asked quite frequently by patients is, is contrast dangerous? And they're very different experiences. So CT contrast, many patients will have had, and we often get told people feel like they're doing a pee while we inject them with the contrast, they get a kind of warm feeling. And CT contrast does have a very small risk associated with it. And so, you know, we generally quote quite low numbers and it's probably less risk than I'm quoting here, but there's about a one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 risk of having a, a serious reaction to CT contrast. And it's very important for patients that if they've ever had a reaction to CT contrast before, we must know as radiologists, because we like to keep a very close eye on you and sometimes give you some medication beforehand before you have it again. MRI contrast, on the other hand, is extremely safe. Now, a lot of patients look up on Google about gadolinium and gadolinium agents, which is what we use in MRI. But the key with MRI contrast agents is really there's no risk to the patient. So you may see things on Google about the, the dye staying in your brain long term and having effects, but that's really been disproven with some of the new contrast agents. So Jonathan talked briefly about where meningiomas occur. And I'm going to try and show you where they occur in a 3D model, because sometimes it's quite hard for patients to get their head around exactly where it's arising. Now, Dr. Parkinson talked nicely about how the, the skull is a box and then the gray brain is on the inside. And then we have a thick lining, which is the pachymeninges or the dura, which is where meningiomas arise from. And as we can see here, we're slicing through the, the head like that. And so we're seeing one axial slice. But if you can imagine looking at the, the brain in 3D, there's actually a lot more of this thick lining in the brain, all of this purple thick lining. They're the regions where meningiomas can arise. And so this is actually a scan, not of a patient with meningioma, but just a scan that's not normal, but is showing you where all of this dura lies. So you can see between the two halves of the brain, all the way around the edge of the brain, you see that nice thick line. That's all the pachymeninges of where meningiomas can arrive. And as, as we come down into the, 
lower part of the head. So now we're slicing down sort of through the ears. You can see the ears here. There's still all that lining around the smaller part of the brain, so the cerebellum. And then importantly, there's often a lot of lining that we see around the back of the eyes. So behind the globes and where the eyes sit in your bony socket of your eyes and also next to your pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland sits down deep in the brain and there's thick lining adjacent down here, thick in the brain. So this is another very common location and that makes a huge difference for patients. And so I'm gonna just show you a couple of examples of where these classic locations are. And you'll often see in our reports how we describe these by location. So this one obviously is, is very superficial. This is the skull, it's near the surface. You could almost touch it. And so for Jonathan and the surgeons, he'll talk about his approach, but you know, this is quite a superficial, easily accessible lesion, so to speak. And then we talked about how there's a dividing line between the two and they can arise in the folks. So this is the folks that you'll often hear us talk about in our report, the folks cerebri is the dividing line between the two hemispheres. Sometimes they're a bit more complicated. So this is another fairly uh, common location of a meningioma. This is called a planum sphenoidale meningioma. So there's a lot of Latin, um, but it sits right down in the base of the brain and it sits right next to the pituitary gland. So if you can imagine Dr. Parkinson and the neurosurgeons need to somehow get into this region and not cause damage, even though it's very, very deep in the brain. And then this location, which we talked about, which is adjacent to the cella. So, you know, this is the cella where the pituitary gland sit. And then on either side of the cella is the cavernous sinus. This location is probably the most complicated from an imaging perspective. And it's the one I get asked about a lot and why it's so complicated. And we'll go on to why it's such a difficulty. If we look down in the cella, so if you imagine this is almost the same level and here's the pituitary gland and the cella and the pituitary gland is sitting here and then the meningioma is arising just to the side of it you can see just how incredibly complicated the anatomy is in this region so all of these yellow structures are all of our important nerves coming out of our brainstem, and they control things like your ability to chew and your some of your facial movements and they control a lot of the movements of your eye but you're also getting some of these big nerves coming back from your eye. And those are the important optic nerves that are in charge of your, your vision, so your ability to see. But it's not just nerves in this location, it's also these blood vessels. So these two big red blood vessels are the big blood supply to your brain. And so these, again, are incredibly important carotid structures. So these are your internal carotid arteries that are running right in this location too. And you can actually see them here, these two black little curvy black things. And so if you imagine we're in this location, even though the neurosurgeons can get in there with clever approaches, the difficulty is how aggressive do you want to be in resecting that given how many complicated structures are around there. One of the less common kinds of meningiomas we see actually are in bone. So even though we talk about this thick rind, sometimes meningiomas start in the rind and then go into bone. So this is another common complex meningioma site we see that can extend into the bony socket of the eye. So you can see that this eye is actually pushed forward a little bit because the meningioma is expanding. And this is why sometimes CT is incredibly useful. So at the top, we're seeing an MRI scan. And at the bottom, we're seeing CT to look at the detail of the bone. And finally, this is a, a rarer location of a meningioma. Sometimes people confuse these as lesions actually in the brain. But if you look carefully, these are the ventricles in the brain, and this is actually a lesion sitting in the ventricle. So it's not actually sitting in the matter of the brain. We often get asked on imaging, does size matter? And as Dr. Parkinson alluded to, it matters because your skull is a pretty firm box. And so anything that's big and anything that's very big pushes on everything. So the more pressure you create in your brain, the more problems you're gonna run into. So patients often develop seizures or they get worsening headaches, but also it can push on other structures and cause problems. So the actual overall size, when I first see a meningioma, doesn't necessarily mean it's a higher grade or more aggressive, but it can mean that you have a lot more symptoms. Now, if I saw a small meningioma that had changed size, that change in size tells me that something is much more aggressive. 
And as we talked about, location really matters. So if something's very superficial and easy for this neurosurgeons to get access to, easy, you know, neurosurgery is never easy, but easier than some of these deep lesions, it's much more likely that we're going to get the whole meningiomatous lesion, so the whole tumor out in one operation. The other thing that sometimes can be a problem is actually the invasion of vascular structures. So if I just go back and look at this again, this thick you know, separation and dura we're seeing, the blue is actually the big vein that's draining all of your brain. So your brain gets lots of arteries in from these little vessels coming in the middle here, but then it drains out through the big veins. And meningiomas often like to sit on this purple dura and then over time, they can invade the veins. And as soon as we start blocking venous flow out of the brain, we create more problems. So a meningioma like this, which is the same lesion, just looked at in two different directions, is right up against this vein where the blue triangle is. And you can see how the vein with all these arrows is running all the way back. And so for the surgeons, this is a very difficult operation because they try and take this out, but there's always a risk to this little vein. They want to make sure that they don't damage the venous drainage of the brain. On radiology, we often get asked, what grade is my meningioma? And it's actually impossible for the radiologist to tell. So I can't look at a meningioma on any kind of imaging and tell you exactly what grade of a meningioma it is. But what I do look for is some features on the imaging that tell me something is a, a lower grade lesion versus something that's a much more aggressive high grade lesion. And these are sort of the common things that I look for. So if something has got a lot of calcium in, or even if it's starting to turn into bone, like some meningiomas, that usually tells me it's a much lower grade lesion and it's been there a long time. Meningiomas that have a nice smooth contour, and I call them pebbles, so they look like nice smooth beach pebbles, they're likely to be lower grade. And whereas shaggy sort of rocky meningiomas with lots of moss on them tend to have, you know, more aggressive appearance. Meningiomas that are necrotic, which means that part of it has died off and it's outgrown its blood supply, tend to be more aggressive. And the thing that I really start to get worried about is when I start seeing changes in the brain. So if I see the meningioma sitting outside the brain and pushing it away, but then I start seeing the meningioma actually invade into the brain, I get very concerned that the meningioma is becoming malignant and much more aggressive. And finally, is the thing I touched on is is the rate of growth. Um, if a meningioma is growing very fast, then I get very concerned um, that, that something has changed. And sometimes meningiomas change in their behavior. So I could be following one lesion for six months, 12 months, two years, and it will do nothing. And then over the next two to four years, it will change. And it can actually change its biology and become more aggressive. So looking at some of the examples, you can see here, you know, these are some of the more, more reassuring and less aggressive features. This is a very densely calcified, partially ossified meningioma on CT. And this has probably been there a long time and had a chance to have lots of calcium develop. And that to me is reassuring, even though it's a big lesion, it's reassuring that it's probably biologically a less aggressive lesion. And again, this is a very smooth walled lesion. You know, it's nicely demarcated. You can see it's pushing the brain away. It's not invading the brain. And that again is reassuring that it's a lower grade lesion. These are things I start to get worried about. So this is a big meningioma and you can see the border is a little bit irregular. So as we follow it around, it's a bit irregular, but also in the middle of the lesion, it's starting to die the meningioma. And that means it's growing and it's growing faster than the blood supply being given to it. And that's a sign that something is growing too fast. And you know that, that starts to worry me that this is a more aggressive meningioma. So growth is the thing that concerns me. This patient's actually had a previous meningioma resected and we are monitoring this meningioma. So even though this is a small two centimeter lesion, the fact that it's almost tripled in volume over one month is a real concern that this is an aggressively growing meningioma, even though it's still relatively small. And then these are the signs that really start to concern us. And particularly for the surgeons, it makes it difficult for the surgeons to get these meningiomas out in one surgery. So even though it looks on just this study like a, you know, a relatively well demarcated lesion, 
you can see just how much change there is in the brain. So in fact, the underlying brain is now starting to look like it's having problems itself and maybe starting to get invaded. And that's a worry that the meningioma is going into the brain. But it can also go the other way. So meningiomas can also go, this is a big meningioma, they can also go outwards. So this meningioma is now invading the skull. So instead of going into the brain, which it's pushing away, this meningioma looks like it's now gone through the skull and there's a big component that sits outside the skull. And again, even to a lay person, you know, you can see just how aggressive this lesion looks. And that worries me that it's a higher grade lesion. So what do I look up on follow-up on follow-up studies? Obviously, you know, this is the preoperative scan and this is a postoperative scan. And this is where there's a real art in imaging and MRI is that sometimes we see changes because of the operation and because your body is trying to heal after the operation. So if this is a Dr. Parkinson patient, you know, this is an excellent resection. We've taken out this lesion. There's nothing left. And you can see just the surgical cavity. But you can see deep to the bone here, little bits of enhancement. And that's where the body's trying to heal itself. And so you're getting a bit of enhancing tissue where the body's trying to heal where the operation was. And we really just keep a very, very close eye on this region to make sure we don't start seeing new little masses anywhere near. And at the same time on follow-up imaging, we always look for new meningiomas elsewhere. And this first post-operative study is very important because it becomes essentially your new starting point after the operation on where we monitor you. So again, it's all the same things I look for on follow-up imaging. I look for growth. I look for new regions of enhancement. I look for new regions of invasion into the bone or into the brain. And also it's very important for the radiologist to know whether there's any change in the patient's clinical presentation. So if you're after the operation, you're completely well, and then you start developing new symptoms. So whether you've got uh, nerve dysfunction or you're having worsening headaches or you're having any kind of seizures, it's really important for the radiologist to know that so we know exactly where to look. So this is just an example of a patient where there's a, bit, a pretty big meningioma, it's a tough location, and it's a slightly funny, slightly irregular meningioma. It's right up against this midline, and here's the vein, and here's the vein. And so, you know, this is, this is a tough one to take out, but it's still quite close to the surface. And so Dr. Parkinson and his neurosurgical colleagues will take it out and try and keep that vein intact. And then after the operation, we've gone preoperative. It looks really nice. We've got nothing there in the surgical bed, maybe a bit of reparative change that so you're trying to heal. And this is why we closely follow you. And these are things we don't like to see. So even after three months, you know, biologically aggressive, higher grade lesions can already recur. And this is actually a recurrence in the brain. So this is a highly aggressive meningioma and we measure them very carefully. I often get asked, and it really is no hard and fast rules, how often we should image meningiomas. And I know how uncomfortable MRI scans are. So a lot of patients don't like going in the MRI scanner over and over again. This is just a guideline which is actually drawn from the National Health Service in the UK. And it really is patient dependent. And often amongst our group, we will talk in a multidisciplinary group about what the biology is and what the pathologists tell us about how aggressive a tumor is, where it is and how much we think Jonathan Parkinson and the neurosurgeons got out, what kind of radiotherapy you've had and what other imaging you've had. But you can see just based on the grade depends how often we're gonna image you. So higher grade lesions, generally we will image much more often than lower grade lesions and very low grade lesions that sit superficially that we know we've got all out. We really only need to image once or twice to say, we're happy to stop taking pictures. But generally we like to image patients quite frequently until we're sure that there's no evidence of recurrence. So that's sort of the basic overview of CT and MRI. And now I'm going to pass over to Dr. Shembury, who's going to show you some of the really interesting nuclear medicine and therapeutic methods that we've got these days, particularly at North Shore, to look at meningiomas. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me okay. So I'm just going to talk a bit about um, meningiomas from the nuclear medicine imaging and uh, therapy point of view. So my name is Jeff Shembury. I'm one of the nuclear med physicians at Royal North Shore Hospital. 
um, I hope I can speak as eloquently as Jamie Drummond, who I could just listen to all day. He's the David Attenborough of radiologists. So, okay. So meningiomas are, um, right. Meningiomas express a protein on their cell surface membrane. It's called a somatostatin receptor. And meningiomas is express this receptor in a much higher density than uh, the normal tissues that the tumors arise from. So in the case of meningioma, the, the dura. Um, now, it's not uh, unique to meningioma, this protein. In fact, it was uh, mostly, um, the interest in it mostly came from neuroendocrine tumors. And um, it has been used as a target for imaging and treating neuroendocrine tumors for many, many years. And at North Shore, we're, we're considered one of the uh, centers of excellent for managing neuroendocrine tumors. And so it was sort of an easy step for us to move into meningioma therapy, considering it's exactly the same receptor that we're targeting. Um, there are actually five different types of somatostatin receptors, but subtype two is by far the most common. And that is the one that we tend to target with all our uh, imaging and therapy techniques. Um, now, in the body, the reason we have um, somatostatin receptors is to modulate hormone production. So your production of insulin and thyroid hormone is managed by um, somatostatin. Why meningiomas should have somatostatin receptors, we don't know yet. Um, but it is interesting to note that in there's some evidence that the meningiomas that grow quicker are the ones with more somatostatin receptors. Um, exactly why this is so, as I said, we're not, we're not quite sure. So what's, what's the underlying concept of what we do? Um, so we, we tend to try and find a target. So in this case, the target is a somatostatin receptor, and that's a protein that's actually embedded in the surface of the tumor cell. And then we find something that we call a ligand, which is basically something that will stick to that receptor. And um, for somatostatin receptors, we're talking about octreotide. And then we need to find something that will let us bind an isotope, which is what we use for our imaging and therapy, to that ligand. And that um, linker protein is called DOTA. So you will hear sort of different terminologies for this scan. Some people talk about octreotide scans, and some people talk about somatostatin receptor imaging, and some talk about dotatate scans they're all the same thing because they're just referring to different components of the procedure that we use to actually um, identify and bind to these lesions. Now, um, I've just realized I've lost my screen. Okay. Um, when we wanna do um, imaging, we take the ligand that is better for imaging, that's called octreotate and we replace the isotope with an imaging isotope. So the most commonly used one is gallium-68, which is a PET isotope, and we can take pictures. We can also swap out the gallium and replace it with lutetium. Now, lutetium is a therapeutic isotope, so with exactly the same structure, we can provide therapy as well as imaging. Now, the actual... Uh, um, structure of dotatate, it's pretty complicated. Um, I can assure you I don't remember it all the time, but the key feature of it is this ring that's hanging off the end here. And the, the ring with the four nitrogen atoms is um, uh, what contains the isotope. So in that ring, we can stick gallium or lutetium as needed. Um, and look, the, the dota, Molecules come in a few flavors, dotatate, dotatoc, it doesn't really matter. So if we um, move on to what, how we actually image use, we, we use a thing called a PET scan. So a PET scan is not, not taking pictures of your favorite companion animal, though for the amount um, my vet charges me whenever my dog needs a scan, I wish it was. Uh, it actually stands for positron emitting isotopes. Um, and so the positron uh, is a type of antimatter. So uh, in normal matter, we have electrons and protons, but in antimatter, we have the reverse of these, and that's called the positron for the electron. Um, 
And we use these isotopes by binding them to metabolically important things, as we've just shown with um, targeting that somatostatin receptor. And so nuclear medicine is more about imaging the way things work than the way they look. So what happens is that whatever substrate we've used goes to the, the structure that we're interested in, in this case, meningioma. When it gets there, it's releasing these positrons. Now, being antimatter, they actually um, can't really exist in our universe for too long. So they, they move in the tissue until they strike an electron, and the two of those um, have what we call a mutual annihilation event. They wipe each other out. And in doing so, they release these two X-rays or gamma rays that are at 180 degrees from each other. And it's these two arrows coming out of what we capture with our camera. So here's a, the, the camera and you can see it's multiple ring detectors. And so when those X-rays are released, they impact on that detector and the computers that are associated with the camera can backtrack and tell us exactly where in the brain um, that uh, event happened. And so we know where the lesions are. Um, so being able to then take the pictures, um, that's always very nice, but what do we do with those pictures? How are they actually useful? Um, so we use them in a couple of things. Sometimes they can be used to plan surgery for a particularly difficult tumor to, to localize or a small one in an um, unusual place. And I'll just have an example here um, of a, uh, a optic nerve meningioma. And so the little orange spot is where the actual tumor is. And that was used to guide robotic surgery in removing uh, that very tiny tumor quite delicately off the optic nerve. Um, it can also be used for other things. So uh, when you're planning your radiotherapy to make sure you have all the tumor in the field. Uh, if you're looking um, after surgery, you just wanna be sure uh, how much has been left behind. And of course, after you've had therapy, just to monitor whether the tumor might be coming back. So here's an example of a patient who's had surgery. Um, now you can see, and I'm showing about the arrow my arrow is not displaying on your screen, um, but you can see those two bright pink spots at the edge of the surgical margin, and they're small areas of um, meningioma that have been left behind. Um, the red arrow is pointing to the pituitary gland, and so uptake in the pituitary gland is a normal uh, uptake. So if you see a spot in that position, don't worry, that's actually entirely meant to be there. In this patient who had a resection on the left side of their brain, um, you can see there's actually no tumor left whatsoever. So um, when planning what other treatment they need, it's good to know whether you've actually got macroscopic or no macroscopic disease left behind. So as I said, we can label the somatostatin um, analogs with diagnostic agents. We can swap that out and we can put a thera therapeutic agent in there. Um, and so that converts somatostatin receptor imaging into what we call peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, uh, both very long names for exactly the same thing, just swapping out the isotope that we use. Now, when you're gonna put an isotope in, you wanna select an isotope that's going to provide the kind of treatment that you want. Uh, most isotopes um, emit uh, gamma rays or beta particles or alpha particles. Um, we'll get to that in a second. I just want to mention that the other thing you probably need to know about um, radioactive materials is their half-life. So if you're talking about radioactive waste from a nuclear reactor, you're talking about half-lives of 250,000 years. The things that we use are much, much shorter than that. Um, and the, the basic concept is that for every period of a half-life, half the isotope disappears. So this is a representation of a, of a radioactive atom. Um, with all its uh, positrons, uh, sorry, with all its protons and neutrons in, in red and blue. And if it's going to break down into a more stable uh, material, it can emit a gamma ray. And the gamma rays are X-rays. They travel long distances. They're good for taking pictures. Not a lot of absorption um, in the tissues unless you give a very directed beam, which is not what we're doing. The other option then is that it can have a beta decay, that, so that means it sends out electrons to break down. Um, the electrons are very small, but even so, because of their, they're quite charged like a little magnets, so they don't travel very far in tissues in the range of two to 12 millimeters is the normal distance a beta particle might move in a tissue. So if it, we bind that to a tumor, 
it's going to irradiate the tumor and the tissue around it for a small distance. Now, alpha particles are big, like they are 8,000 times bigger than an electron. So they can't move very far in uh, tissue before they're going to hit something. And uh, that, uh, that process of hitting something usually damages it. So they leave what we call ionization trails in the tissue, and that destroys um, proteins in the tissue. And of course, the ones that we're really interested in is the DNA of the tumor cells. So the DNA uh, will prevent the tumors from reproducing. Um, they only travel about 0.03 millimeters in tissue. So once you get them on target, they stay on target, and that's, that's a benefit of alpha therapy. So which ones do we, do we actually use? Well, in Australia at the moment, lutetium-177 is by far the most commonly used isotope. It has a half-life of just under a week. Now, it's what we call a low energy. Um, Vito, if you think about um, the energy that is uh, similar to how far you're throwing a ball. So a low energy one, you're just giving a ball a gentle toss and it only moves a couple of millimetres. So it stays pretty localised to where we want it to be. And therefore, it's good for small tumours. Uh, the other interesting thing about lutetium for, for us in the imaging field is that it also releases a gamma ray at the same time. So we can take a picture of where the lutetium has gone. So uh, with the same injection, we can both know what we're treating and, and how well we've localized to where it's gone. Um, another option is yttrium 90. We use that a bit for liver treatment in Australia, but not uh, so much for other treatments. It's a bit less uh, easy to handle. Um, it doesn't have a gamma uh, ray, so we can't really visualize how well it's been distributed. Um, and it's got a higher energy. So it, it's a ball that we throw harder. So it travels up to 12 millimeters away from where we injected it. That's fine in nice big tumors, maybe not quite so, so good in a smaller tumor. Now, the things that are on the horizon are these alpha therapies using um, things like actinium and bismuth. Um, they are still very early days in, in treatment. They are very potent because of the amount of energy that they deliver to the tumor. Um, actinium has a long half-life, so it sits around killing tumor cells for a long time. Bismuth has a much shorter half-life. But you've got to weigh on one side the treatment effectiveness by having a nice long half-life versus the amount of damage you do to normal tissues. And so at the moment, the exact role of these alphas and how best to manage them without causing too much damage to healthy tissue uh, is something that's still being worked on. So when we um, give the uh, therapeutic agent, there's another step that, that I haven't mentioned up till now. So we inject the material, it finds its way to those somatostatin receptors and it binds to the surface of those uh, receptors. And in itself, that's okay, because we know that the, the beta particle is gonna travel a couple of millimeters, so it'll probably uh, get into the cell. But luckily for us, part of normal cell biology is that these surface receptors are recycled. And so they get drawn back into the cell. And so if you have a, a um, isotope with a you know, long half-life, those things get dragged into the cell where they can actually release the um, damaging beta or alpha particles exactly where we want them inside the tumor cell. Just to give you an example, this is what a dotatate scan can look like. Um, and this is using gallium. So nearly all the black spots you see, um, the small black spots are tumor. Uh, the H-shaped the structure in the neck is the patient's thyroid, and there's also a bit of liver and, and kidney uptake present there. But the important thing is that after each dose of the actinium therapy, the black dots get less and less, and that's the and evidence of the, the quite remarkable tumor kill that you get from this uh, agent. However, if you look at the thyroid gland in the neck, it also uh, gets less and less, and so as a bystander, we're doing some damage to a normal, otherwise healthy organ. So. That's the, the, the balance that we have to find when using these kind of therapies. Just to show you some of, um, some of our um, patients that we've looked at, uh, this is the patient who had dotatate um, scans. So the bottom right is 2014, and the most recent one was just uh, in January. And over seven years and eight lutate therapies, there has been slow growth of this tumor, but you need to remember that the tumor was growing back in 2014 when we first intervened and that uh, um, she's actually done very well over, over that time frame. 
All right, look, I'm just gonna leave it in this in this um, view because it seems to be working better. So look, um, at the moment, the patients we select are patients who basically have failed all other treatments because the, the treatment's not well proven. We haven't been offering it to just everyone who come, comes along. Um, and we, we try and have multidisciplinary team agreement to make sure the oncologists and the surgeons and everyone all agree this is the, the best approach for the patient. Um, now, in, as far as side effects go, I just want to say they're actually pretty minor. Um, most patients, and we do lots of patients with lutate therapy for neuroendocrine tumour, we do at least four a week. Um, most of these patients go through the entire course with only very minor uh, side effects. What side effects do they get? Um, you can get some bone marrow uh, involved, suppression, so you can drop your blood counts. That almost always requires no treatment whatsoever, and we just watch and it will recover uh, spontaneously without intervention. And the other thing is your kidneys. Now, you may have noticed on those images that the kidneys uh, had a lot of uptake in them. The material that we give is washed out through your kidneys. And so your kidneys um, do absorb a fair bit of radiation. The, um, there was one study that suggested that the uh, um, kidney function could drop by about 10%. Now, we, we do what we call reno protection. So most of the damage is because the material sits in the kidneys. If you actually give a patient amino acids, you saturate the kidneys, they don't get that absorption. And so we, we use that to protect the kidneys. And since we've been doing that, we see almost no reduction in renal function. So, so how good is it? Look, there's not a lot of evidence. And the reason is that there's not a lot of patients in this area. So to, to conduct a large trial, which is randomized, is not that easy, um, particularly when you want to get a group of all patients who are grade one who've had, all had exactly the same treatment. It's not that easy to get those numbers. So if you look, for example, at this paper here by Marin Cech, um, they only had 34 patients in this particular group, but they showed that 23% uh, of those 34 got disease stabilization um, with minor side effects. Um, the other thing they noted, which was kind of interesting, is that the better the uptake, the better the treatment. Well, that sort of makes sense. The more, the more you can deliver to the tumor, the better it responds. And so the blue line was the patients who had good uptake versus the red line, um, which is the patients who had not as good uptake and, and the blue line is demonstrating that they survived for longer. Um, there was a study by Bartolome in 2009. They looked at 29 patients. They also showed disease stabilization in two thirds. Um, but a lot of their patients were grade one patients. So the, the slower growing ones anyway. So maybe not so surprising that they did a little bit better. Uh, more recently, uh, there was a paper in 2016 that looked at 20 patients and they showed, again, roughly 50% of stabilisation and the lower grade ones did better. So what do we know? Look, I think we can say that uh, lutate is very safe as a therapy. Um, it even can be given if you've had almost every other therapy known to man beforehand and still get some um, stabilisation in about half the patients. The more you take up the, the, the tracer, the better you're going to do. Um, and um, I just had a, a couple of uh, quick uh, examples to show before we finish. This was a patient who had one of these uh, bases skull, which are very difficult lesions to remove surgically. Um, and uh, he'd had multiple prior treatments. And, and the tumour was growing rapidly, and he was losing sight, uh, particularly in that left eye. Um, and we gave him um, four courses of lutate therapy. He had very good uptake. So these are lutate images now, not PET images, showing um, uptake in that meningioma. Um, and following that treatment, um, his tumour did continue to grow, but the rate of growth slowed dramatically. And the, the component that was at the base of the skull in particular stopped growing, which was good news for him. His visual symptoms stabilised, and he did really well until, unfortunately, he passed away from a, a different uh, condition. Um, this is another patient, again, just to show you that the, the, they've had uh, treatment in between the top and bottom scan and the base of skull component had stabilized, even though the, the more lateral component on the left had grown slightly over that time period. So I think that there's a big future in, in this therapy. Uh, we've still got a bit of work to do to demonstrate how it's best to be used and, and the uh, long-term efficacy that we can um, achieve. But I think... Uh, it will be a component of the therapeutic armamentarium uh, in years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. That's a great explanation of nuclear medicine imaging. 
Uh, I'd like to bring back Dr. Jonathan Parkinson, neurosurgeon, who will talk about uh, surgical options. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying the talk so far. I've been answering some of the questions as they come in, but we will have the Q&A section at the end. Um, my talk now is really about surgery for meningioma and where it fits in. We've sort of heard about some of the imaging, so we've worked out what, what's going on, um, how are we going, and we've heard a bit about lutate, which is sort of our last line of treatment to some degree. How, what are we going to do about, um, uh, about what we found on the scans? Um, so why, and why do we do an operation? Well, there's a few reasons, certainly, the main reason that we in meningioma is that it's often the definitive treatment. And I'll talk about that again in a second. We talk about reducing the mass effect. And that is if we have a, again, back to that concept of the lump inside the box of a fixed size, um, we want to remove any pressure we can, but also more, more locally and more focally if we see pressure on particular important structures in the brain. And I think Jamie uh, Drummond spoke to that very well in terms of some of those skull-based meningiomas. And you'll see a couple of examples of that uh, with me, with, with my talk um, now. Obviously, the other big benefit of surgery is that we know definitively then what's going on. And, and I talked a little bit before about some of the advanced pathology that we can do. But most of the pathology that we, we do is, this, uh, is the grading system that, that a few of us have spoken about. Fundamentally, though, excision of a meningioma is the goal because for most meningiomas, complete excision results in cure. And this is probably Australia's greatest contribution to the neurosurgical literature. It's from a, a, an Adelaide neurosurgeon, and, and I don't know if you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, in 1957, he published this paper. Um, and this is... At, and we can get a little bit confusing when we talk about grade because this is a different grading system to the pathology grading system. This is what's called the Simpson grade. And this is what talks about the extent of resection of the tumour. So ideally, um, we would remove not only the complete tumour, but also all of the affected dura from which the tumour appears to be arising and any underlying bone. So that's not only the tumour itself, but also the, um, the site from which it's arising. And, and the grading system goes from that ideal sort of Simpson grade one resection all the way to where we just do some sort of decompression and, and perhaps biopsy the tumour. The vast majority of these tumours, um, we're able to do something between a grade one and a grade four resection but it all again comes down to location and it all depends on where the tumor is and where the dura is. Most of my talk's going to just be a whole bunch of case examples of meningiomas that I've operated on over the last 10 years. And just, I'll talk about some of the intricacies of the surgery as we go through that. So what do we do? Almost all meningiomas, the surgery is done under general anesthetic. Some of you have probably heard we do some surgery with patients awake. Um, but for meningioma, because of the nature of the problem, um, that is that it often looks very different to the normal brain and the, and the, uh, and the distinction between the, the brain and the tumour is usually relatively obvious. Uh, we do this with patients asleep. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do is remove the tumour or remove as much of the tumour as we can without disrupting any of the underlying brain or any of the other structures uh, that the tumour may be near. And again, I'll talk a little bit to some of that. But we do have some things that help us and help make the surgery more safe. Most of what we do, we use electrocautery, which is basically a current that, that coagulates the blood vessels, um, that helps us develop the planes. There's a fair bit of a kind of mechanical aspect to it, us um, you know, pushing and pulling, for want of a better word, and cutting little bits of arachnoid and things, um, and also suction. But there are a couple of sort of advanced things that are really important. Now, this is sort of, I guess, the mainstay is what we call neuronavigation. And, and I've used the example of Brain Lab, which is what we have at North Shore Private um, and, and also at Royal North Shore. Basically, what this is, is that, that and you'll see in a couple of more slides, is we, we end up with the, 
the patient's scans being loaded onto a computer and then using infrared through this camera, we can tell where we are relative to a scan. This is an example where we have, this is a reference frame. We've told the computer where the head is relative to this reference frame. So with this pointer that again has these infrared little uh, balls on it, um, we can tell where the tip of our pointer is relative to the scan. Uh, and this is a patient uh, I operated on last week that, um, that most of us on the panel have been involved with. So what we can do then is, this is this reference frame I was showing you in the other slide, is that we can then map out where the tumor is and that's this, this big uh, circle here and that's what it looks like on the MRI um, and make uh, our incision around that so that we can re remove the tumor. Now, there are a few operative pictures and things in this slide, I uh, in this talk, I should, should warn you. The other big tool for us is this thing, which is, Again, this is one particular type of, and this is the type that we use at, at Royal North Shore and at North Shore Private. Um, but what this is, is called an ultrasonic aspirator. Now this one's called Sonopet. And basically what it does is it's, it, um, this handpiece is basically a small ultrasound probe that um, basically pulverizes the, the tumor to some degree, and then it has suction in, involved. So using ultrasound, it destroys the tumor uh, and then we can suction it out. Now that's useful for us because if we have big lumps, you can understand in the brain, we just can't uh, shove the other parts of the brain or the nerves out of the way in order to, to, to pull a lump out. Um, we need to be able to reduce the size of the tumor so that we can safely get it out without causing any damage to the brain around. And again, back to location, that's a very variable in terms of the location, in terms of what we can do and in terms of what's around and how much room we need to make for ourselves to get a tumour out. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of, of cases and talk about some of the aspects of surgery that make that, um, that help us uh, in terms of the considerations when I'm doing operations and, and when surgeons are. This is what we call a convexity meningioma. So it's over the sort of convex surface of the of the um, brain, uh, it's, it's a lump, it's coming in. So you can understand if we're talking about that Simpson grade one clearance, that if I come in from outside here, um, remove some of the bone, I should be able to cut all the way around this in, in, th in three planes and be able to remove that tumor out and get all, not only all of the tumor, but all of the dura from what, which it has arisen. The other thing I want you to notice here is if we ever look at this sort of black layer between the brain and the more white layer, which is the scalp, you see on this side that it's thicker. And again, but, um, Dr. Drummond showed this in his talk, that this is some bony overgrowth. So part of when we're doing these resections, we need to remove some of the bone. Now that bone does, it's not necessarily got meningioma in it, but there's this thing called hyperostosis where the, brain, the bone become, due to something that the meningiomas make, the bone becomes more overgrown. And that's something we deal with at surgery too. On the next slide, um, this is a little bit more difficult. Um, this is an, another, another tumor on the convexity. Uh, as you can see on this side, it's, it's right on the surface here. Um, but it's very reasonably close to the, the speech area of the brain. So for me, that pre presents an extra level of complexity in that I need to make sure that the brain underneath is very well preserved um, so that the patient doesn't develop a speech problem. Um, these are some photos from that patient's operation. This is the scalp being reflected back. This is where I've removed the tumor from the brain. This is the tumor. And just by way of scale, that's a one inch long um, cottonoid. So um, that's the tumor. This is what it looks like in the surgery. I've localized this um, flap based upon what that uh, stereotaxy showed me, and I've removed the tumor, minimally disturbing the brain underneath. This meningioma, and again, Dr. Drummond spoke about this, was a little bit more of a challenge because yes, it's on the surface, but you can see it comes up to this sort of triangular structure here in the midline, which is called the superior sagittal sinus. And that's the main, drain that, the main vein that drains the brain. So in these sort of circumstances, we tend not to try and remove all of the tumor, include, 
we can sometimes see the tumor coming right up against this, sometimes involving the wall of the vein or sometimes being within the vein. And obviously, if we're talking about bleeding or air getting into the venous system, that makes the surgery much more dangerous. And because of these other treatments, you're, you're going to hear from Professor Back about radiation, but also lutate that, that we've heard from Dr. Shembri about. Um, it, it means that when it comes to a balance again of risk and expectation and uh, risk and reward, if you like, um, we're probably better off leaving a bit of tumor. If it continues to grow, then we can um, zap it with some radiation or use these other treatments. Now I'm gonna talk about a few what we call skull-based meningiomas. So meningiomas that are more near the bottom of the brain and the skull. This is in one called the olfactory groove. So just to orientate you, this is the back of the head, the front of the head. So this is all the nose. The, the black is all the air within the nose and the sinuses. Um, and the, ner the nerves, the olfactory nerves come down and they um, uh, come down through the bottom of the skull here to give you your sense of smell. These sort of tumors um, are a little bit challenging because it's no longer on the surface of the brain. We need to work out how we can get here safely and this patient had a craniotomy at the bottom of the brain here, and I went underneath and removed the tumour that way. But this one's a little bit smaller um, and sitting a little bit further back. And, and again, Dr. Drummond showed a couple of these so-called planum sphenoidale meningiomas. And this is one that actually we accessed and removed through an endoscopic endonasal technique. So that is with a camera up through the nose, we're able to remove the bottom of the skull I remove the tumour down and then uh, reconstruct the, the dura, the thick lining around the brain and allow that. Um, so that is a lot less invasive for the patient, uh, but it is, um, does have some risks with fluid leak and only a certain small number of meningiomas are suitable for that sort of technique. And this one is again, a very challenging tumor. It's a bit further back, again, plantum sphenoidale, but it extends down here. Again, I think Dr. Drummond showed a tumor very similar to this. I want a draw, to draw a couple of, uh, attention to a couple of features here. One is um, this black, which again, Dr. Drummond showed a black curvy line uh, on one of the other images that he showed, and that's actually the arteries um, in the brain. So they're very closely associated with the tumor. And these two little gray lines here, they're the optic nerves. And in fact, this patient was um, losing vision. This is a very challenging patient because she was actually pregnant at the time of, um, uh, of presenting with some loss of her vision um, that was as a result of the meningioma. I think that's worth mentioning. And there may have been a question about hormones and about pregnancies that we do know that meningiomas can react to estrogen and progesterone and some of the... Um, some of the, the female sex hormones that, um, so we have seen patients with meningiomas that either the tumor becomes more swollen or they grow um, within pregnancy. And obviously from an anesthetic perspective, that creates a problem. This patient was losing vision. So in fact, and she presented at about 32 weeks of, of pregnancy, she had a, um, a cesarean section at 36 weeks and then I removed the tumor. Um, here, this is one optic nerve here. Again, this is about uh, half an inch wide, just to give you some scale. This is down the operating microscope. You can see even this little red on the outside there, that's the tumor coming underneath. I've already started to get into the tumor a little bit there, but it goes all the way around here. And this is this after I've removed the tumor. This is looking at the pituitary gland. There's both the optic nerves can be seen now. And those, bit, those bits of tumor are gone. And thankfully, her vision improved. Another part of the brain that's challenging is what's called the posterior fossa. So now we're at the back and the bottom of the brain. This is a, and again, there are a lot of structures in this area that are important. Um, J Jamie spoke to the cavernous sinus and all the nerves that run through there. This patient actually presented with loss of hearing in her right ear. And that's because this tumor came right up to this hole here, which is where um, the tumor. Uh, the nerves rather that, that supply hearing and movement of the face um, come out. This is quite a large tumor, as you can see here. Um, one of the vision nerves, one, one of the nerves that supplied mo movement to the right eye um, was affected with this. I was able to remove this tumor. The patient actually had some double vision for a little while, but that, that resolved. 
um, that was related to, to one of the nerves supplying the muscular supply of the nerves. This gym is even harder. There's that hole again, the internal acoustic canal with the nerves going out. That's the one on the other side. You can see this is on the other side of the nerves. Again, a reasonable size tumor. It's indenting into the brainstem. Um, again, this patient had surgery. And even further down, we can see this is what's called a frame and magnum meningioma. The frame and magnum is the hole at the bottom of the skull where the spinal cord escapes. You've got this huge lump here. Rather than having all this space to run through this, the top of the spinal cord, the medulla's only got this thin ribbon here. And if you have a look, this is this gray structure pushed right across here. That's the tumor. Uh, sorry, that's the spinal cord being pushed back by this huge tumor. Um, this is one of those scans I looked at and this patient walked into my office and I thought, how, how are you walking with that degree of spinal cord compression? But um, these sort of tumours, and this is the principle of what we call skull-based surgery, which obviously I do a lot of, um, is where we have to remove a lot of the bone um, in able to, be, to be able to get into a tumour uh, without, uh, without having to move the nerve structures. So, for example, we're not able to just come in through the back here and remove and move the spinal cord out of the way, hold it out of the way while we remove the tumor. That would cause irreparable damage to the spinal cord. So I have to come in more from the side, removing a whole bunch of bone at the bottom of the skull and the top of the spine in order to get in there and remove the tumor. We talked about, um, you know, in my first talk, I talked about meningiomas occurring in the spine. Um, as well as in the brain, it really is anywhere there's arachnoid and anywhere there's dura. This is an example of the in the thoracic spine. So this is um, the back. This is your front. The heart's basically here. This is a large tumor. Again, occupying most of the space through which the spinal cord has to run. This is the tumor here. And this is the spinal cord squished all the way over there. And again, an operative photo of this case. This is the spinal cord um, actually coming down. These are a couple of the little nerve roots going over the top of it. Another one there. And this is the spinal cord all pushed over by underneath this, this uh, layer of arachnoid. Here's where the tumor is. And you can see once I've removed the tumor, there's still this little nerve coming over the top and the spinal cords move back to the middle. Once again, for scale, this is a patty, patty that's an inch long. So again, all done under the microscope, very fine and precise. Um, surgical work. So again, once we remove tumors, um, obviously it all depends on the grade as to what we do next. Um, most of the grade one tumors, we remove them and then we, we watch. Um, grade two tumors is a, is a huge area of controversy where the patient should have uh, observation or radiation. Um, and that depends on the tumor location. It depends on the extent of resection. Um, but, but there's such ambiguity in this area that we're actually doing a clinical trial about this at the moment. Um, grade three tumors, we know that they're more aggressive. And so they're the ones who, who will almost always get radiation. So in conclusion, um, surgery is obviously the mainstay of the treatment for meningioma for the reasons that we discussed earlier on. Um, it really is about location of the tumor in terms of the complexity of the surgery and, and the extent of, of resection we're able to get. Um, and it really is a very individualized uh, thing. But I'm very grateful for, um, for the, the collegiality um, between our whole team in, in that some of these tumors are very difficult and that's where we, need to, we do need to think about other treatments. So on that note, I'll, I'll hand over to, um, to Professor Back uh, to speak about radiation. Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan. Uh, we'll now have our last speaker, Associate Professor Michael Back, who's a radiation oncologist, and he'll talk about radiation and treatment options. Thank you. Thanks, Marina, and thanks, John. Uh, I think today's sessions really emphasise the team approach that's been used to manage this condition and the fact that we have to individualise the treatments on so many occasions because of the different ways that the people present the different natural history of the tumors, some grow quicker, some grow slower. And very importantly, and we wanna emphasize this, it really depends on which part of the brain is being affected as to where uh, potential issues might arise. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. 
So what the first thing I want to mention is a little bit about what is radiation therapy and, uh, and uh, how we approach radiation therapy in the management of patients with meningiomas. The aspects about radiotherapy is that it's very much a targeted therapy and precise. And as we've mentioned, it has to be individualized. So the brain has got multiple different areas. And for our patients with gliomas, we consider those uh, tumors in different areas individually, but even more so with meningiomas, because it depends on where it is in the brain, varies the extent of surgery and whether you can avoid radiotherapy or whether radiotherapy should be offered afterwards. In the actual delivery of treatment, we vary it through a number of different biological ways. Um, the total dose that we give to the tumor and the number of treatments. So a standard course of radiotherapy would be treatment being given daily, Monday to Friday, over a period of six weeks. If a tumor is very small, localized and away from good tissues, we can actually increase the dose each day and deliver the treatment over a shorter course of treatment, over a shorter course duration. So a treatment which may be of six weeks, you might be able to give a higher dose over a period of two weeks or three weeks. And then it comes down to if there's a very small lesion, uh, often less than two centimeters, then you might be able to deliver that treatment in one dose. And that's called stereotactic radiosurgery. Now, stereotactic radiosurgery uh, is used in meningiomas and is increasingly used to treat individual small lesions. So that single high dose is potentially available to be used. However, it's not the common type because when you've got a larger meningioma, you can't deliver that treatment by stereotactic radiosurgery in that single high dose because you put too much dose into the surrounding brain. Now, the way we deliver the treatment on the different machines also varies. So in Australia and around the world, the most common type of treatment we have is delivery via a linear accelerator or a LINAC. And this is a standard machine which is available in um, most major hospitals. So a LINAC uh, uses electrical energy to produce radiation and it can be used for either the six week course of treatment, a two week course of treatment, or it can also deliver stereotactic radius surgery. So it can do all the range of treatments. Patients, as we can see here, are mobilized in a mask to keep them nice and still. That's not to protect you, but that's actually deliver the dose in a very accurate way. Other machines that are available in Australia, but not commonly, are the gamma knife and cyber knife treatments. So a gamma knife is a, a, a treatment delivery machine that only can really deliver stereotactic radius surgery. Uh, the one in New South Wales uses a head frame, which is attached or screwed into the patient's skull. So it's quite invasive and usually limited to one treatment. Uh, whilst in Queensland, the gamma knife has got a relocatable head frame, uh, which can be used for multiple treatments. It's still treating very small lesions to a, a very high dose and it's really got a limited use for the majority of our patients that present with meningiomas. The CyberNife's interesting technology, that's uh, a linear accelerator, which is on a robotic arm, which can swing around. It's more commonly used for tumors that move rather than uh, lesions in the brain, which are very static, but it can be used to deliver radius surgery or the shorter course treatments. What's exciting is proton therapy, which is coming into Australia in about 2022, 23. And that will be a machine in Adelaide. Once again, the proton therapy is a dedicated machine which can deliver radiotherapy to multiple different size targets. Uh, and it has some advantages biologically of giving a high dose to one particular part of the brain, but reducing the dose next door to the, where the tumor is sitting. However, there are still a lot of uncertainties regarding protons, the doses we give, and also the way that the doses are delivered. The benefits of protons were quite large many years ago, but the linear accelerators ex have changed a lot. So the benefits are not that high now for the majority of people that are being treated. And the studies are showing that. 
The key thing in delivering radiotherapy is you want to deliver the dose to the tumor so we can hit the tumor cells and the normal cells in the adjacent tissues can repair. So that way you get good killing of a cancer, but without injury to the surrounding tissues. And the best way to do that is to deliver the treatment slowly over a period of six weeks. We're allowing the normal cells adjacent to the tumor to repair. The key aspect of it is actually not the machines. The key aspect's not the way the beam is actually delivered. The key aspect is actually trying to hit the target and trying to find out where the tumors are. And in that way, once we know where the tumor is, we can then reduce the amount of radiation delivery to that area. And therefore we allow the tumors to be hit and be killed off, but without injuring the surrounding brain tissue. And the software to deliver that is where things have really changed. So the machines have been around and the machines are fairly equivalent. They've got a lot more uh, automated parts and they can deliver the more sophisticated therapy. But where things have changed is all the digital technology and the targeting of the treatment. So back in 2005, this is the way we used to treat people. And that was with what we call 3D conformal therapy. And that 3D conformal therapy would hit the dose, um, deliver the dose and hit the tumor target. Uh, but you would do still put a lot of dose into the surrounding brain tissue. In 2015, we really moved to what we call IMRT or intensity modulated radiotherapy, where we're targeting the dose very much to where the tumor is and minimizing the dose to the surrounding tissue. So we can deliver high doses to where we want the dose to be delivered and lower doses to the surrounding brain tissue. And really the software, which has allowed us to uh, deliver that type of treatment. And the targeting becomes so much more important and knowing where the tumor is. So for a radiation oncologist, we now need to think more like a neurosurgeon, know exactly where we're putting our radiation beam equivalent to the way the neurosurgeon puts their knife for resection. And the software has improved so significantly that we can put dose in various areas in the brain to a low dose and we can put higher doses into um, other areas and put very high doses right to where we want it. And that uh, is just something which my department produced within a period of about two hours one day uh, and showing how well we can dose paint or how well we can deliver the dose in a very uh, sophisticated way to various targets of the brain. So what are the specific issues for meningiomas when we're dealing with radiotherapy? And these are four key principles which I'll outline. We need to individualize the radiotherapy dose for each site in the brain, understand where that tumor might infiltrate, use sophisticated imaging to design the radiotherapy, and then the most important thing is balance the risk and you know, how, when the tumor might relapse and what effects it might cause if it does relapse versus the impact of radiotherapy if we deliver the treatment now. And the key thing as John mentioned and Jamie mentioned, beforehand is the impact of the tumor really depends on where it is in the brain. So this smaller tumor on the left is right around very important structures in the brain, uh, nerves to the eyes, the brain stem is being compressed there. Whereas the other tumor, the other side is much larger, but it's in a space where there's a bit more room to move. It's still a significant issue, but there's more room and the surgeon's more likely to be able to operate on something at that site. Likewise, we need to understand where meningiomas might be infiltrating, whereabouts in the brain it's, it's heading, and especially knowing where it's heading along the lining of the brain or what we call the dura, and less commonly where there's invasion into the brain or to the adjacent bone. We can get all that information from the MRIs. As Jamie mentioned, a good CT scan can also help a lot. And as Jeff outlined, these dotatape PET scans are really changing the way that we can alter the places where we deliver the radiotherapy because we're getting a better understanding where there is residual disease and we're not missing things. So we're not getting geographical misses. So in that image there on the right, we see the, the brain 
an area where the tumour is at the front invading around the bone. The dotate scan gives us very good details of exactly where the tumour is sitting. These dotate PET scans we now use routinely in our practice to design radiotherapy. It's helped with the surgeons and it helps to diagnose the tumours, but we use it really specifically to work out where things are at. So here's an example where there's a, a meningioma going on the surface of the brain and higher up, there's an artifact from uh, part of the surgical procedure and the dotate scan was able to demonstrate there was tumour in there, which we would have missed if we were just dealing with the MRI alone. Another example where a patient was found to have one lesion on their MRI, the dote PET scan confirmed that lesion. But then when we did looked at the dotate, we found there was about six or seven other lesions in the brain. So if we just targeted that one lesion, say with the stereotactic radiosurgery, rather than treating the rest of the uh, surgical cavity, we would have missed uh, the majority of the meningiomas. Now the key thing with this is we've got the technology to deliver treatment and we can deliver it a lot safely, but we need to balance that risk of what's going to happen if the tumour grows and how long it's going to grow versus the impact of actually delivering the radiotherapy. So we need to estimate the growth rates. And the best way to do that is actually look at the history, if we've got it there, of patients who have presented with their MRIs and looking to see growth rate over time. And that's what we do in a lot of cases. We may not come in with treatment straight away, but we watch closely. And then we make a decision to work out where the growth rate is. We need some more algorithms to help that and research is underway to try to demonstrate that for the future. Uh, but at the moment, really utilizing the MRI scans over time will give us an idea of how quickly a tumor is growing and therefore try to predict when it might make more side effects. And then we can weigh up whether we have to give radiotherapy now or later and accept that there might be some side effects with that treatment. Now, I'll concentrate on this for a little while, which is really the potential late side effects of radiotherapy. And these are the things which are, need to be taken into consideration. In the short term, there's hair loss, which is temporary and grows back, it's partial. And there's some tiredness associated with the treatment. But these are the key things in our patients who will be alive 10, 15 years plus down the track that we might have to deal with. And most importantly, in recent years, we're finding that these risks are actually a lot less uh, over time because of the improved treatment techniques that we've demonstrated. A stroke risk is there. That stroke risk uh, is now being shown to be very much similar to what the underlying risk in the population is. So whereas in the past we treated large volumes of brain, the more recent areas where we're treating smaller volumes, we're not seeing that high risk of stroke. It's also age dependent. Cognitive change is the same issues in that a larger volume of treatment uh, can potentially injure normal brain, but by giving the treatment slower and more targeted and understanding where important cognitive structures are in the brain and minimizing the dose to those areas, we can actually protect against a lot of those effects. And we're now in our patients with gliomas and we've got our own data on this in seeing how people are functioning in the five, 10, 15 years after treatment is that we're not seeing those late cognitive changes. Radiation induced malignancy is a feature. We know from atom bombs and nuclear accidents that radiation could cause cancer. And we know that uh, in also the patients we treat, but the risk is very small. It's about one in a thousand, 10 to 15 years after the radiation therapy. That is age dependent. So if you're younger, it might it might be down to one in 750, but it's still very low compared to the risk of the tumor growing. And the recent studies are showing that when we're using these more uh, sophisticated techniques such as IMRT versus 3D conformal therapies, the older techniques, we're actually seeing less long-term side effects or less side effects of emerging. And that's reassuring. So when is radiotherapy used in meningioma? And John's outlined the grading of the tumors. And so we take that into consideration. John also outlined the extent of resection and we take that into consideration. So for the grade one, the benign meningiomas are very small meningiomas. We're seeing um, that radiotherapy can potentially have a role. 
and also in the bulky residual ones, we're also seeing it a role as well. So in the very small ones, it could be used as an alternative to surgery or observation. So you could treat those with high dose stereotactic radius surgery. Uh, they're very small and you, the data is suggesting you can get equivalent results in a 10 year period compared to surgery. You don't get the tissue diagnosis, however. So there is a treatment with a, a, an element of uncertainty. For the larger lesions, the bulky residual tumors, there's definitely a role for radiotherapy to minimize symptoms of growth. So a tumor in this situation, which is right around all those important nerves, we can't let that grow. We sometimes ask the surgeon to take a little bit of the way to create some space, and then we mop up the rest of the tumor. Atypical meningiomas, which is a grade two meningiomas, if there's residual tumor after a surgical resection, then there's generally a role to deliver radiotherapy. So in a tumor like this, which is big, going right down onto the base of the skull, the surgeon will potentially leave tumor behind there and there's a role for radiotherapy. Where the controversy is, is in, these, is in patients who've had a complete surgical resection after an atypical meningioma. And it's, a, it's a currently a significant controversy where some patients may receive treatment, other patients won't. We're trying to get some guide and it, often it depends on which part of the brain the tumor is located. So with surgery alone, we're seeing re risk of relapses in patients with atypical meningiomas in the order of about 25, 30% in the three, five years after treatment. If we deliver upfront radiotherapy, and these are in historical controls rather than direct controls, we're seeing control rates in the order of uh, greater than 90, 95% at three years and getting control rates greater than 90% at 10 years. So radiotherapy is helping to minimize the risk of relapse, but it's not necessarily for every patient. So a tumor like this on the convexity or on the edges of the brain where the surgeon's got room to move, there might be a greater role for, for just managing this patient with surgery alone and watching. If the tumor regrows, the surgeon can come back in then, and then we offer radiotherapy at that time. Whereas this tumor, although it's much smaller, is situated right next to the eyes. A surgeon may clear it out completely, but there's a higher risk of cells being left behind. And if it regrows in that area, then there are potential risks associated with that. So whether you offer radiotherapy will often depend upon the discussion of what's happened with the surgeon and the ability to perform further surgery at time of relapse, and then weighing up those features and coming down to patient choice. There's just been completed a study around the world, which we were part of, uh, looking at either giving radiotherapy or observation after surgical resection for atypical meningiomas. That's now closed and we wait the results of that, but really good long-term results are still going to be five, seven years plus away. So we have to make decisions based upon the information we have at the moment. In the nastier type of tumors, the anaplastic ones, yeah, these are much more biologically active invading brain we will offer radiotherapy in the majority of situations after a resection, even if a surgical resection is clear. For relapse meningiomas, as we, out, as we outlined before, it needs to be individualized. So a patient like this, where the tumor's relapsed, uh, it's been detected, we've known it's there. The issue is, do we come in now or do we watch? And that really has to be based upon individual features, development of symptoms, where things are emerging. It's exciting in our other brain tumors that targeted therapies or drug therapies might be coming through uh, and treatments such as immunotherapy as well. At the moment, these drug therapies really don't have an established role in the majority of patients with meningioma. We're looking at studies around the world, but thus far there does not appear to be any specific role for chemotherapy, immunotherapy, outside of an experimental option. These targeted therapies are exciting, where you can actually latch on to an abnormal protein in the tumor and deliver a drug into that area. Or as Jeff mentioned previously, we do the same thing with radioisotope therapy, where we latch onto it and deliver a, a high dose of radiation specifically directed straight into that tumor based upon that abnormal protein. And that lutate therapy is being utilized in selected patients at North Shore and we can use the dotate scan to work out where the tumor is, know it shows uptake, and then deliver that dose to that area. And as Jeff mentioned, the early results around the world 
suggests you can stabilize disease. We're not sure of the best recipe to use for this lutate, whether we give one, give two doses, four doses, how frequently we give it, how, how what gap we give. So we're still developing that. We've seen some promising results for us to continue forward, but we're waiting peer review assessment of our results before uh, they're formally presented. So in summary, the key issues for radiotherapy meningioma come down to these, these points. We want to individualize radiotherapy for each site in the brain. We want to understand where the tumor might infiltrate, because that's going to guide whether, where we put the dose and where we, whether we have to deliver now or whether we can hold. We can use sophisticated imaging to design the radiotherapy. And then most importantly, we balance the risk of the tumor itself regrowing or um, causing symptoms versus the potential side effects of giving radiotherapy now. And finally, this was due to be the launch of what we call the Sydney Meningioma Clinic on the North Shore campus. Unfortunately, like everything else in New South Wales at the moment, it's been COVID affected. Um, and the new North Shore Health Hub, uh, the launch of the cancer center in there has been delayed probably by about a month. But as part of that, there'll be a specific clinic which we're developing to address patients' issues with meningiomas. We'll have a team approach in our MDT, and then we'll have a triage clinic, which hopefully will be able to guide patients on this sort of multidisciplinary approach. And thank you very much. Dr. Back, that was a great presentation. So I'd just like to take this opportunity. We're going to go into question and answer time shortly, but I'd just like to show appreciation for the time and effort the doctors have given for today. Um, they've all got busy schedules, so really appreciate the excellent presentations that have been given out today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the collaborative style that these doctors have and their accessibility for patients. It really helps people. Um, I'd like to thank, um, and this is where we'll open up with the Q&A panel, uh, all the questions that have been coming in, whether they came in um, initially or, you know, as we've been live, uh, it just helps us to answer questions and deliver our, um, our presentations towards the questions that have been answered. And I think that majority of the questions that have been put forward have really been um, answered. And I see that Dr. Parkinson and Dr. Drummond have very nicely been doing a live answer to a lot of the questions, which has been great as well. So the doctors did talk a lot about, um, the, you know, the population of patients that we have, who it's more common in, the median age of patients, talked a fair bit about the genetics and the environmental factors and causes. There was a lot around grading, uh, how people presented location of tumors and why that's really important. Dr. Parkinson spoke about uh, extent of resection, skull-based optic nerves, those sorts of things. So a couple of the questions that I thought that may not have been answered and whether we can answer these or not, um, there was one question around vitamins, supplements, foods, whether there's anybody, uh, anything that anybody can take or eat that will either prevent a meningioma or stop growth. Can anybody answer one of this question? Maybe Dr. Back? Yeah, thanks, Marina. Yeah, look, um... A dietary approach is obviously very important for general health and dealing with any of illnesses which might arise and also the treatments we give. Generally, what's good for your heart will be good for your brain because it's going to be good for the blood vessels. We don't know of any specific dietary features that can change the risk of meningioma or the natural history of meningioma, but we do know that good general uh, diet, good nutrition will aid in managing those side effects, especially when we're talking about surgery and radiotherapy in the brain, the potential risk of injury to blood vessels. We want those blood vessels strong and the best way to do that is look after your general health and good nutrition. But unfortunately, as it stands at the moment, there's no specific dietary manipulation that we can do for either our brain tumors in general or our patients with meningiomas. Thank you. 
So uh, another sort of, I'm trying to keep these questions a little bit broad. Um, and as I said, I think we did answer a lot of the questions throughout the, today's presentations. There were a few around symptoms and side effects, whether they be um, side effects from having the actual lesion around headaches or nerve pain, um, or whether it's from you know, surgery or treatment that people have had around optic nerve damage. And just things that we can, do for patients to help with these things or advise them on how to manage them. Um, so maybe Dr. Parkinson and Dr. Back. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, in terms of uh, neurological recovery, there's often not a great deal of specific kind of um, treatment that's helpful, mostly time, but also some physiotherapy to sort of um, you know, particularly if we're talking about limbs and muscles and all those sorts of things, um, getting them going, but also some, you know, uh, even around sort of the eyes and, and eye muscles and all those sorts of styles of things. In terms of the pain, we see, you know, there's a lot of mostly drug treatments that are effective for, for the sort of nerve type pain that we see when there's, that when there can be um, uh, pain related to a meningioma or to dural involvement. So, I think that that's, you know, that's kind of going to be the mainstay there. I um, hope that answers the question to some degree. Michael, do you want to add yeah. anything to add? I guess what we're seeing in a lot of our patients is, uh, and this is in the glioma aspects as well, is one of the presenting features is personality change or subtle neurocognitive deficits. And uh, relieving a large mass in the brain by surgery will allow the pressure to come down. So that often improves a lot of it. But over the longer term, um, if there's been changes in the brain, we're trying to optimize people's neurocognitive function. And that comes down to uh, exercise, uh, being active, and also identifying where those particular deficits might be. And you can then uh, try to augment life's decisions around those. So in our patients with meningiomas, we, we have to be very aware that we're gonna have patients and we hope to have patients alive 15, 20 years plus down the track. This is a long natural history disease. So we need to manage those other side effects as well, or those effects, which often come around because of the extent of the tumor. So important things on mobility, important things on exercise and keeping people active in that way. Uh, we try to keep life as normal as possible, but try to make adjustments and augment aspects in their life to try to improve that functioning. So it's important we recognise those things in our patients and then deal appropriately with that. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask, because I can't see some of the questions that are coming through live, if the panellists can have a look at those and respond appropriately. So pop your hand up if there's anything coming through. Um, I, I would can... To ask Sorry. Dr. Drummond quickly, though, um, just about, because we do have patients that obviously get their... Uh, radiology or MRI reports and may read um, comments um, and may not always understand the comments that are made uh, on the radiology report. So I'd just like uh, Dr. Drummond's opinion about that. Yeah, I mean, th there was a specific question, I think, from one of the uh, members about the location and the, and the report that, it, of, that they got about their scan. And they can be very, very difficult to interpret radiology reports. And I just wanted to just sort of show you the complexity that the words carry, but really it's all just descriptions. So it's all just anatomy. So if I just show you this example of, of a left extra axial, so this is a term we use to mean it's a tumor which is actually outside of the brain matter. So something intraaxial would be more like a glioma, something in the brain. Posterior fossa means it's sort of deep down, sort of near the back, the lower part of our brain, and I'll show you a picture. And then all of this is really just descriptive about where it is and what it's causing a mass effect on. So we try and help the surgeons and really describe where the tumor is and some of the structures it's pushing on. So just as an example, in this case, if we follow the scan down, I can actually show you the scan dynamically. So this lesion that's been described here would be, if I stop it right here, it would be an extra axial lesion. So it'd be on the left-hand side. And in radiology, this is the left and this is the right. So it's sort of the wrong way around, but it would be on the left-hand side in here. 
and it would be sitting in the posterior fossa. So this is the cerebellum sitting in the posterior fossa, and it would be up against the petrous apex, which is this dark bone, and this dark bone is the petrous apex. And the pons is part of your brainstem, so it's pushing on the pons, it's pushing away. And it's just talking about the trigeminal nerve, which you can just see if you're very carefully look, you can just see a tiny little line there, and that's actually one of the cranial nerves. So sometimes lesions sit here and push against that. So all we're doing in our reports, even though it's a lot of gobbledygook and a second language, it's really just anatomical description. And we're just trying to tell the neurosurgeons exactly where those lesions are. So, you know, it's very hard for patients sometimes. Radiology reports, I think, can be very difficult to approach for patients. And, you know, we're trying to get better at saying there's a big lesion or a small lesion or it's getting bigger or it's getting smaller. We're trying to make it simpler for patients, but it's that kind of anatomical detail that the surgeons really want to see in our reports. Okay, we're nearly coming to the end of, sorry, we're nearly coming to the end of the session, I just wanted to bring up quickly that after the event, there is a feedback survey. Um, it should pop up into the chat area, but it'll also be emailed to uh, all attendees if they could get that feedback survey uh, back to us. That would really help us um, to be able to plan sessions down the track. Um, so just... Going back to the panellists, is there any further live questions that have come through that anybody would like to mention? There's someone, um, we've got a question from Pam, who basically, two things, she, she, she said she's just done a systematic review for uni on the topic of, topic of diet and in German, she's found no specific links, which is great because that reinforces what we were saying before. Um, I guess the question that Pam's put is, what would you use for a larger tumour that is in an area that you don't want to operate? So I just want to say that that basically we, we can operate on almost anything. It's just whether or not we should. And by that, I mean, what are the risks of surgery and what's the likelihood of benefit? So I think um, Michael back gave a couple of quite good you know uh, kind of some good discussion around the principle where sometimes these larger tumors that are in um in a location that can be difficult we might remove part of the tumor for a couple of reasons to reduce the bulk as i was talking about in my talk but also to provide the pathological information give some sort of estimation as to how quickly this thing may grow uh, and then potentially augment that with the other therapies we've been talking about, obviously, particularly radiation, but, um, but, also, uh, but also some of the other more advanced treatments that are coming along. Uh, Michael, did you want to speak to that as well? I don't know if you can see the question. Yeah, uh, I think it comes down to uh, following what the uh, rate of progression is and where, how long it needs to take before a major symptom might arise. Uh, blood vessels, et cetera, can be pushed out of the way, but is it going to then cause a clot in the blood vessel and cause a stroke, et cetera? We, as a radiation oncologist, we don't shrink tumors down straight away. So when we treat a lump of the tumor, it sits there for a while and then it gradually comes down over time. And that reduction happens over years. So if we've got pressure on a nerve, then we need the surgeons to create a bit of space and then we can deliver the treatment, which then reduces the pressure in the brain further over a long period of time. So it's really a combined approach. And, and sometimes we do the surgery and we allow the brain to settle down for three or four months. And then we come in with the radiotherapy at that time. With meningiomas, generally you've got time to plan and consider. And that's another important aspect, which we probably haven't emphasized enough, is that you really want to map this out. If you're individualizing treatment, there's no standard recipe. You want to really get the, the right combination and use all the diagnostic uh, procedures we've got to help map out get as much information as possible. And finally, look, looking for the future, we've got to look for what other therapies are, are coming around. We're doing a fair bit with Lutate at the moment um, and we're seeing promise there. And then once you get a good results in Lutate, there'll be cousins of Lutate come through, which will be potentially a bit more effective. And the other aspects is what's happening in general oncology or cancer treatments at the moment, which is more targeted therapies, 
trying to find out what proteins are abnormal in each type of tumor and see if we can find some drugs which might work against that. Drugs don't get up into the brain that well, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, and thus far in immunotherapy, we haven't had much gain in our patients with primary brain tumors. So we potentially be a little bit more pessimistic about that sort of response in patients who have got meningiomas. But we need to explore this and we need to get our patients through an immediate crisis, watch them and manage this like a chronic disease rather than going for a short, sharp, quick cure. Um, so it really needs to be individualized and everything needs to be mapped out effectively to try to help that decision making. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Uh, great presentations. I think we're nearly coming to the end of our time for this session today. Um, I think it's been a great amount of education and information for patients. Um, everybody's a little bit different. Um, and their experience of the meningioma is, is different as well. Again, if I can just remind everybody that um, the survey will be emailed out to you if you can just help us out and get that back to us when you can, just to give us more information about future events. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.